The United States makes great use of the prison, more so than any other country in the world. In fact, 25% of the world's inmate population resides in American prisons. This raises the question about what came before the American penitentiary. How did early modern England punish its hardened criminals? Find out today on Footnoting History. Welcome to Footnoting History. I am your host, Leslie Skousen, and today we will explore the ways in which early modern England punished criminals under Tudor and Stuart monarchs. The idea of locking dangerous criminals in a dedicated building is a relatively new one, historically speaking. For much of English history, during the development of the legal system that would eventually be adopted by about a fifth of the world, the primary penalty for harsh crimes was fairly simple. Execution. Murder? Execution. Rape? Execution. Theft? Well, that depends, but anything over 10 shillings led to execution. That is not to say that people were dying in large numbers on the early modern scaffolds. There was room in this system of juries and judges to provide forgiveness, mercy, or even justification. The final sentence often relied on the reputation of the accused, the testimony of character witnesses, or the sympathy of the jury. In general, medieval punishments were more physical in nature than the austere prison system used so often in today's modern cases. And so, studying early modern England is an opportunity to view the change in idealized punishments from medieval to modern. Beyond execution, early modern justices had a few other punishments that they could rely upon. Fees and fines to replace the cost of stolen or destroyed goods, for instance. There were also the public punishments, standing in humility with a paper on your head announcing your crime to all who could see, or being locked in the stocks, or something more permanent by mutilating the body. Specific crimes might call for the splitting of tongues, cropping of ears, or even branding the skin with a red-hot iron. All of these punishments served two purposes. First, and most immediately, to force the sinner to feel the pain of violating social mores. But second, to show the public what happens to those who break the law. The early modern period is an exciting one to explore precisely because so many new ideas were transforming its institutions. England's legal system was one such institution. Physical punishments were becoming somewhat less popular and new theories of consequence took their place. Surviving records indicate that physical pain was being replaced by alternatives newly in place for consideration in court. One such example would be the local workhouse. It's a system called the Bridewell. Today, a bridewell might refer to a local jail, but the first bridewell was a transformed royal residence. In 1553, King Edward VI granted the former royal bridewell palace to the city of London for civic use. The palace had been built for his father, Henry VIII, who used it as his primary London residence from 1515 to 1523. After the death of Cardinal Wolsey in 1529, Henry VIII transformed Wolsey's palatial Hampton Court as the primary London residence. In the absence of the king, Bridewell Palace was converted to living quarters for visiting diplomats and ambassadors. By the time Edward VI transferred ownership of the palace to the city of London, a local bishop named Nicholas Radley converted it to a house of correction. This was not the same as a modern prison, but there were enough parallels between bridewells and prisons that we may consider the bridewell to be a proto-prison institution. It was more of a short-term workhouse to hold petty criminals and vagrants. The average residence of a bridewell was young, between the ages of 11 and 30. They tended to be convicted of petty antisocial crimes. You know the type, theft, abusing public property, fornication, vagrancy, debt, this was the kind of behavior for which modern British offenders might today receive an ASBO. For those unfamiliar with modern British legal enforcement, disorderly teens, graffiti artists, and petty criminals can be given an antisocial behavior order, or ASBO, to temporarily restrict their movements. This could force them away from criminal areas or give them an early curfew as a way to stem the tide of more serious offenses. In early modern England, this meant that vagrants, social pests, truants, and petty criminals might be swallowed up and placed in a bridewell for short-term rehabilitation. Inmates kept at Bridewell Palace under Elizabeth I were subject to isolation, hard labor, and low morale. They served relatively short sentences of only a year or two. 
The law stated explicitly that a convict could not be kept there for more than two years. Such a long period of temporary isolation was considered cruel in an age when painful punishments were largely accepted. How things have changed. Legal theor theorists back then would be horrified at the idea of a 25-year sentence, just as we would be horrified at cutting off an arm or splitting the nose for a crime. Inmates' days were regimented with labor assignments and religious instruction. They separated families for age and gender-appropriate work assignments. The idea was to provide religious and civic training to instill good behavior for a criminal's eventual release. The role of the Bridewell was especially important in the eyes of post-Reformation London authorities, as the dissolution of the monasteries, convents, and chantries exacerbated existing economic factors that contributed to a rise in vagrancy and crime. Tumultuous social change and religious wars also contributed to individuals and families who were forced to seek new resources away from their home parishes. Without religious centers for serving the underprivileged or the Catholic tradition of giving alms, no administrative alternatives existed to assist the poor, the unemployed, or the disabled in times of need. In response to the growing vagrancy problem, Bridewell Palace became an experimental solution to provide work while attempting to discourage recidivism and permanent vagrancy. The conditions were kept purposefully harsh. Authorities theorized that such conditions prevented the lazy from staying too long and gave inmates a suitable sense of piety for their suffering. The palace conversion was a large success. The City of London had a steady stream of youthful workers to rebuild bridges, improve the quality of roads, and support the needs of a growing metropolis. Other cities began to build local bridewells. The local workhouses were found across England, into Scotland and Ireland, and later even in Canada. The ideas born in Bridewell Palace during Elizabeth's reign set the groundwork for the modern penal system. The institution revolutionized methods of social control and punishment, contributed to the new poor law system, and implemented the effective use of hard labor as a form of deterrence. Eventually, any jail or workhouse became known as a bridewell, until 1779, when Parliament clarified the role and characteristics of the penitentiary that the U.S. uses so fully today. A penitentiary would be different, even more restrictive, and even more punitive, the draconian conditions of penitentiary life, where prisoners stayed entirely on their own even to do work and eat, allowed only the Bible to pass the time until they donned masks and attended chapel services incognito. Work was still a major part of the day, but isolation was the key to the inmate's suffering. There was less social interaction in the penitentiary than in the bridewell, where at least inmates worked together and ate together and the penitentiary ultimately became the modern prison. Yet prisons and workhouses were not the only innovation created in post-Reformation England. Legal minds experimented with trading execution for a brand on the skin and a sentence of hard labor. Harnessing the power of young men with a penchant for criminal behavior seemed to hold a lot of promise for the lawmakers in the 17th century. And so in 1621, Members of the House of Commons designed a bill that would replace the death penalty with an eight-year stint of labor. Convicts of so-called small offenses, grand larceny for instance, could be sent to the bridewell for labor assignments to serve the local urban community, or they could be assigned to a local master in rural communities. Local masters tended to be wealthy landowners who bid for the right to watch over the convict and reap the benefit of that convict's labor. The convict was branded with a large V on the chest, V for vagrant, and his movement would be heavily restricted. After eight years of good behavior, the convict could be released to his family or parish community. These convicts were treated as servants and had more freedom than those living in close-quartered bridewells. They had freedom around the farm, but limited rights to leave the area without written permission. They were not reduced to living in a cell or suffering extreme isolation. English authorities were more comfortable with a peasant class than locking people up, causing insanity from isolation could be so cruel. So what happens if a servant-like convict resents this punishment and attempts to escape? This is where the 1621 proposal gets very interesting. It states that, and I quote, If any shall escape, or run away, or commit violent acts against the master of their work, their keeper, their captain, or any other, 
then such shall never have their liberty, but continue as slaves all their lifetime without relief or redemption. In this sentence, Parliament proposes a lifetime of imprisonment for the criminal. For a community that did not believe in lifetime imprisonment, this is very curious. Why not simply execute the escape artist? Why risk having a convict around for life? The proposal goes on to describe that the co escaped convict will be punished with a new brand. Seared into the chest over the V for vagrant would be a new letter, the letter S, S for slave. And the House of Commons was suggesting a two-tier system that would produce a caste of slaves made of English subjects to serve the farms of wealthy landowners. Their lives would, would involve chains. Their labor would belong to the local gentle families that purchased their convicted sentences. The timing of this proposal, 1621, also holds great value. Jamestown was founded in 1607 and Plymouth in 1620. Exploration of the New World was in full swing, and ideas of transported convicts, indentured servants, and kidnapped African slaves were circulating around the Atlantic. Proposing a system of creating slaves for labor on English soil makes sense in this policy-making historical moment. Nevertheless, this system was never actually adopted. The Parliament of 1621 was suddenly prorogued, disbanded as an international crisis relating to King James' son-in-law and the proposed Spanish match pulled Europe into disarray. Parliament's demands during this crisis complicated international matters, and he sent the lawmakers home before they could ratify their bills into law. Perhaps it is just as well. The legacy of the slave system affects the world today in myriad ways. Ultimately, the proposal to create a system of branded slaves from English subjects was not revisited, and instead the English government began to lean into a future prison system mixed with elements of mercy, such as the use of convict labor and transportation schemes to the colonies, or even applied mercy by offering the secular version of benefit of clergy. Nevertheless, knowing that this system was entertained, debated, and proposed gives us new insight into the minds of the English legislators of the 17th century and to the origins of the current system of imprisonment in the United States. This has been Footnoting History. If you like the podcast, be sure to visit our website, footnotinghistory.com, where you can find links to further reading suggestions related to this week's episode, as well as a calendar of upcoming podcasts. You can also like us on Facebook, and follow us on Twitter at History Footnote. Until next time, remember, the best stories are always in the footnotes. See you next week!